welcome to A Quaker Take, a podcast from Quakers in Britain and Woodbrook, exploring a Quaker perspective on the world. I'm John. And I'm Elizabeth. We're back and with a special series exploring reparations in the context of racial and climate justice. Now, this is a conversation that Quakers are beginning to become more and more involved in, but it's also something that's new to many people, and that's both Quakers and in wider society. And so throughout this series, we'll be talking to various people, some of whom are working alongside the Quaker community in exploring this issue so that we can learn more. And today we start by looking at what we mean by reparations and why it's important to faith communities. I've been speaking with Rebecca Wu and Edwina Pitt from Quakers in Britain about this. Yeah, so I guess without further ado, let's hand over to Pastor Elizabeth. I'm here with Edwina and Rebecca to talk about reparations. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'm Rebecca Wu and I work on climate justice for Quakers in Britain. And I'm Edwina Peart and I work as the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator. So we're here today to talk about reparations, but it feels like the first thing we should probably talk about is what are they exactly? And what do we mean when we're talking about reparations? I think that the first thing I want to say is that this conversation is not new. The call for reparations has been made in different ways by different groups, literally for centuries. And so what we're talking about is a recognition that harm has been done and the need to take action, to make amends and to repair the damage. Yeah, it's interesting because I wanted to find out how it was defined by, you know, looking online and seeing what kind of publications like Collins or Encyclopedia Britannica would define reparations as. And what came up predominantly in their definitions were references to war and finance. So they would cite World War I and the money paid by Germany, who were defeated to compensate the victors for some of the costs that they outlaid during the war. And then there's another set of definitions for reparations around uh, international law, which tends to link uh, reparations to violations of human rights and justice. So it doesn't just see the remedy as something that's financial. And I think that starts to touch on what Edwina was saying about repairing harm. For me, it's that same thing. It it is about recognising harm and making amends. And also that reparations are a process, a mechanism of accountability, of owning responsibility and working together to repair that harm. I think that I'd just like to add one further point to what you're saying, Rebecca, and that is that the call for reparations currently carries both a moral and a healing dimension, and that's some of what you're saying. And I think that it's really important for us to recognise not just the historical harm, but the ongoing damage we're still feeling the effects, we live immersed Mm. in the effects of actions that took place hundreds of years ago. And from conversations we've had before, we're not just talking about reparations for slavery. Yeah, that's right. I think people can feel a bit overwhelmed by that idea of, you know, there being many different things that we might need to repair. So... Yeah, there's a range of different reparations calls that we're planning to explore in this podcast in the climate context. You can relate them to what's called loss and damage, which is being experienced by climate vulnerable countries right now and has been for decades around the world. Um, And they want the harm being done to them to be repaired. But there's also many other examples. And yeah, we'll get onto those, I think, a bit later. We will, because it's not just the Atlantic slave trade But we can think about the epochs that followed of empire and colonialism and the fact that this whole series of actions violently forged a particular link between Europe, Africa and the Americas and really set the stage globally for a certain type of hierarchy. And within that hierarchy is racism and that took root and it endures until today. So why is it that Quakers are now starting to talk about this, if they are talking about this at all? I think that lots of faith communities started to talk about this around 2007, when Britain was celebrating the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. 
but it's actually gained momentum over the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. There have been lots of social and economic protests that have taken place that have just highlighted the inequality. And actually, in faith communities, Quakers are somewhat behind the curve. Other faith groups have apologised and are starting to look at their role in the slave trade. Quakers are starting to look at it, but they've yet to apologise or acknowledge a corporate responsibility. Do you think that's part of a uh, feeling that, well, Quakers are a part of, and quite a big part of, the movement for the abolition of slavery and against the slave trade, and so haven't really felt they needed to, almost? I think so. I think that is most definitely a part of it. The way the story is told through Quaker history, all we hear about, all we know about, is their role in abolition. We know nothing about Quakers' roles in slavery. That is starting to be uncovered. There is some really good work that's being done currently, but this is new, and it troubles that single heroic narrative that we've held to date. I think what's interesting about it as well is it kind of touches on ideas of personal responsibility for things that happened in the past, allocation of that responsibility and blame and shame. And if you go down that track, you can very easily lose the bigger picture, which is that we're all complicit in the systems that we live in. So, you know, in those discussions that are starting to happen, it's really important that we don't get too hung up on, you know, exact quantification of things or mechanisms for things, but rather the spirit of that there are wrongs that exist around us and that we need to repair. Mm. And you think kind of what you were saying about faith groups, different faith groups starting to explore it, that idea of complicity, that idea of an understanding of something that is bigger than like the everyday sort of political life of the nation should be something that is examined and explored in a faith context. I think that faith brings an additional dimension to it. It brings a dimension of what unifies us as human beings. It brings a dimension of what unifies us with the earth. Um, Richard Reddy, in his 2007 book, Abolition, had a really poignant quote. He said... This ghastly and protracted episode in human history, rather than giving rise to collective sorrow or lament, has instead been relegated to a footnote in human history, which most people prefer to ignore or overlook, out of a sense of shame, pain, anger or fear. And I think that a firm faith, a belief in something outside of us, requires us to be able to look at things outside of shame, pain, anger and fear. I think that point about shame is really interesting and it's something I think that came up for a lot of people who were responding to the murder of George Floyd and started going on an anti-racist journey or exploring their relationship to racism. And there's several people who I think write or speak quite compellingly about it. One of the things that stuck with me was Brene Brown, who's an American therapist of some kind, I think yeah, she is. Yeah, power of vulnerability. That's yeah, her, isn't it? yeah. And uh, she talks about being here to get it right, not not being right, um, as a kind of way to think about this stuff. You know, you don't need to prove that you're not racist. You just need to work on being anti-racist and not getting stuck in that kind of I'm ashamed of the ways I've behaved in the past. And there's another quote that I really like uh, from Adrienne Marie Brown, which roots that in the kind of context of social change. And she says, I've come to believe that facts, guilt and shame are limited motivations for creating change, even though those are the primary forces we use in our organising work. I suspect that to really transform our society, we will need to make justice one of the most pleasurable experiences we can have. And I think that's a really useful reminder to people that, you know, some of the work that we do is really challenging, but at the same time as doing it, we need to remember that relational, we need to remember that joy. Obviously, we need to recognise that there are harms around us and, and that needs rectifying, 
but let's not let's not get stuck in this kind of individual shame and that stop us from moving forward and it's quite exciting the idea of like building a society that is better than the one that came before it right in theory like that should be an exciting and fun opportunity yeah if we can really grasp it yeah it is i think it's all of those things and i think that that's why it's necessary to examine the past not to wallow in it but to actually assess how we are in the positions we are now and then to be able to make an informed decision about how we can move forward from the structures that restrict us, Mm. from the things that no longer work, from the attitudes that we want to let go of, Mm. we don't want to carry forward. Yeah, we need to understand them Mm -hmm. in order to lay them down. Yeah. So what would, given that that we're kind of coming back to the topic of reparations here, what would reparations actually look like? Reparations can take a variety of forms. I don't think there's any one way that they have to look. Just as we can think about the different types of harms in terms of economic, social, political, ideological, how we think about certain things. So because there's a variety of harms, there have to be a variety of solutions, there have to be any number of ways that we think about addressing and repairing this harm. And I think that it's important to think about it in broad terms because part of the fear is getting stuck in the concept of being asked for too much money, Mm -hmm. more money than you can afford to give as a society, as a faith group, as any kind of group. But it isn't just about money. It's about education. It's about opportunity. It's about a new narrative. It's about... um, A sense of identity. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, I've heard a lot of people talk in the context of loss and damage, for example, about, you know, how how do you go about identifying which bits of loss and damage to pay for and where, where do you draw the line on that? And people can get really hung up on on the mechanisms. And that, like shame, can act as a bit of a barrier to even getting started. And I think it's really important that we don't need to perfect what reparations looks like. We don't need to perfect what loss and damage compensation payments might look like before we start to try and make amends. Step one is to start to try and make amends in whatever small way we can. And so Hilary Beckles has spoken about this publicly. He he talks about how important it is for us to be open to a multitude of forms of reparation, like Edwina's saying, that are an iterative process. So again, that kind of emphasis on like we're not going to get this right first time around. It's it's a dialogue, it's a it's a partnership for us to kind of reckon with our history and to, to be in conversation about that between the harmed and the people who might have harmed. And together to grow and develop and move forwards into that other world that we're hoping to build that's very different and where we're not, you know, restricted by those structures in the same way that haven't served us. I think so. And I think that essential components of whatever we decide upon have to be love, truth and justice. It's a response that encompasses all of those elements that is required. Otherwise... Without this kind of spiritual component, we'll just have economic or political models. They will be the ones that dominate. And they're inadequate. We know that from history. Mm. We know that you can't just legislate. We know that you have to you have to bring people on board. You have to engage them in the discussion. You have to convince them. You have to enable them to see different paths, different ways. And that's why a conversation around reparations, that's why raising reparations is important because you start to have that dialogue. Yeah, and I think, you know, we can easily get lost in individualism, I think, in the age that we live in. And it's important not to get too focused on that. But I find that sometimes when when you're thinking about these big abstract concepts, sometimes it's helpful to think about it on a personal level. So if I take an interpersonal example, if I've harmed someone in my life or I've been harmed by someone, what would justice 
and accountability look like to me? Would it be as simple as me just giving them some money and hoping that, you know, that's enough to, to repair the harm that I've done for them? Or is it more about the dialogue that we might have about that harm, a chance for me to hear about the ways in which I might have harmed that person from them directly, and for me to take responsibility for that, for, for there to be understanding about what's happened rather than a simple transactional monetary payment. And yeah, maybe that conversation is a bit messy. Maybe sometimes we go a bit backwards before we go forwards, but it's much more satisfying and rewarding for me if I know I've had a conversation with that person then I've just paid them off, as it were, for the harm that I've done them. Yeah, if you can't buy people's love with gifts of money wherever it is or whatever has motivated that money, it's it's about how do you build that relationship afterwards. Yeah. And So do you think that translates quite well on a societal level then? The whole question of money as part of compensation really resonates with me because initially I was against reparations for slavery because I thought that this is so huge. The harm done here happened over such a long period of time. You can't possibly even begin to think about compensating for that with money. It was generations upon generations of people that were brought into this system. But I changed my mind. And I changed my mind through listening to the conversation. And actually, it was a particular event that was hosted by the Baptist Church as part of their Sam Sharp lectures. And it was Vereen Shepherd who spoke so eloquently about the damage caused by the Atlantic slave trade and continuing to be caused by its legacies that we as black people continue to live in the wake of. She changed my mind. And that's why I embrace the fact that it's not just money, although money is involved. It's having that conversation. It's thinking about, thinking with these acts and actually examining the enormity of the changes that the slave trade brought about. The fact that as many Africans live outside of the continent of Africa as do inside it because of their forced movement by Europeans, not because of a personal choice. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think, you know, I'm aware I've said in the interpersonal example that, you know, money doesn't cut it. But what we also have to remember is that the reason that we are often talking about reparations is because people have ended up in very unequal economic situations where there is a big imbalance in who holds capital and wealth. And, you know, in the context of loss and damage, we're talking about countries that have been impoverished through the colonial era uh, and who continue to be impoverished through neocolonial practices of big transnational organisations, companies and and governments who who continue to extract resources from those countries at rates that are very damaging to those countries in terms of interest and loans and the ways in which those projects are financed. And so there's this huge economic imbalance between the countries and, and that leads to obviously climate vulnerable countries having no money to deal with climate breakdown. So in that context, money is very important because that's what they need in order to rebuild after devastating cyclones or floods or in order to ensure that their populations are not starving because of the impacts of climate breakdown. Or indeed disappearing. Yeah. There was that very powerful image of the minister from Tuvalu standing, giving a speech to COP26, standing in water up to his knees as time runs out. And I wanted to add to what you were saying, Rebecca, that it isn't just that nations have found themselves in these positions. This is how colonialism 
empire played out. They were placed and structurally held in these positions. It isn't an accident. It's by design. So given all the reasons you've given around like, the idea of healing, the amount of justice, the amount of like coming together and kind of actually that sense of understanding together as a society um, and the importance of education, what are people's main objections to reparations? Well, there, there are quite a lot of different reasons, I think, that people can feel afraid of reparations. Some of them involve guilt uh, and shame that we talked about earlier. So this idea that I had nothing to do with it or I, I'm somehow being held personally responsible for something that I didn't do. It was hundreds of years ago. Some people, I think hesitate with reparations because they wonder about where we draw the line and I think I probably I previously thought that way too you know it's quite it's quite a lot to contemplate you know we've said that reparations aren't just about slavery Uh, we've said that reparations aren't just about money to hold all of that in your head it's quite overwhelming (laughs) but you know people are are afraid if you make reparations to one group does that then mean you have to make it to another group and then we suddenly start this snowball effect where suddenly everyone's having to pay reparations to everyone and it all gets out of control. I really understand the notion that it wasn't your personal fault that you did not participate personally in um, these actions. But there's also a different type of responsibility. When something is done in your name and when something benefits you, even if you can't directly see that benefit in your family history. You can clearly see it in your societies. You can clearly see it in your, in your institutions. You can see it in the, the ways in which your society is regarded. And so I think we have to move beyond just this personal, I didn't participate in it. And I think about how far does it go? Well, how far might it need to go? How far do we have to take it till all life is viewed as equally valid? Because that's as far as it has to go. Because Mm. that's the truth of it. Mm. And that is a truth that a faith organisation should hold and work with. I think one of the things that comes up in the context of climate reparations, so maybe loss and damage, is also that, you know, right now we we are in a cost of living crisis. People are struggling at home. Why should we send money abroad to climate vulnerable countries, particularly when the amounts in question number in the billions uh, in terms of the damage that they're facing and the money that they need? I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I think there's a much bigger conversation to be had. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a world that is incredibly interconnected. We can't think of things as being miles away and therefore of no impact to us. Climate change has shown us that. (laughs) It's a planetary thing. And more than that, we need to be in solidarity with one another what we're talking about both in the UK and globally are imbalances in power and who holds wealth. And as part of our loss and damage work, that's why we focus on polluters paying for the damage that's been caused, because we know that polluters are posting billions of pounds of profit during a pandemic, during a cost of living crisis. And so if we step back for a moment and we think about who holds the power and the money, actually there's a lot more commonality across borders than we think there is. Um, And in that context, I would say absolutely we should be sending money abroad and we should be getting that money from the people who caused the, the climate crisis in the first place and who got extremely wealthy through doing that. We should acknowledge that as a planet, we all breathe together. And that you can't exploit one section of it endlessly without it impacting on the whole. We're seeing those impacts now. 
you both talk to Quakers on a regular basis about the various aspects of this work. What's the conversation looking like among Quaker communities? Where is it at? And what's it leading to? So I think that Quaker communities and individuals within communities are beginning to wrestle with the story as understood and retold by ourselves. And they're doing that in terms of room names, local history, our testament to equality and our action in the world. There's research that reveals the ways in which bloodstained money was washed in philanthropy, supporting culture, hospitals, schools and churches. It documents the ways different faith communities justified or overlooked complicity, how sanctions were ignored or selectively applied. Within Quakers, there's innovative work addressing the role of Lancaster area meeting in the slave trade, and there's a growth of meetings addressing current day racism. So we can't continue to ignore or sidestep this conversation. It surrounds us and it exists within our communities. In terms of climate work, as I mentioned before, we're talking about reparations already, really, in the context of loss and damage as a form of reparations. And in the round, Quakers have been very receptive to loss and damage and the need for it. But I think there's still a long way for those conversations to go because many of the same discussions come up around how much loss and damage should we pay for? How should we go about paying it? Um, The questions about the mechanics, I think, that people tend to be troubled by. I guess people latch on to the idea that if you can answer that question, we can solve the problem, rather than going back to what you were saying before about it being a much wider issue, which is a much bigger, scarier thing, but also the more exciting thing of healing together as a society and as a community. But you want to problem solve something, so you focus on the mechanics of it. Yeah. I think that one of the interesting things coming out of Anne's research is that the findings have not just been presented to the area meeting, but they include discernment on what to do with those findings. And that's, the discernment process is slightly different to a problem solving process. It engages the spirit. And so Lancaster Meeting are thinking about placing a plaque in the porch to publicly acknowledge and tell the truth about their past. They're thinking about using the information for a cultural all age project and further examining our current lives to explore what we do that continues to exploit people and damage the environment. So they're moving forward and they're allowing space to discern and act. I'm quite interested in the choice of words that we're using to speak about this now. So the fact that you're talking about loss and damage. And I think that this is part of changing the narrative. Changing the narrative to one that is based more in truth, with nuanced understandings of what happened, because that's the only way we can get to where we are now, why we are where we are now, and how we can get to where we want to be, which is to value all life. I also think that we don't need to be afraid of how we make that start with reparations. There are already lots of people who are thinking about tools and ways to go about repairing harm. There are many practices that that look at that specifically. For example, reparations work sits alongside practices of healing justice or transformative justice. And although we don't have time to kind of delve into those in the detail, I'd really encourage people to go away and look up those practices. We're not starting from zero. Many people have been thinking about ways in which we can repair harm. Um, And in fact, many Quakers are already involved in thinking about those different ways that we can repair harm. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. It's great to talk to you. Thank you. Oh, fascinating conversation as ever. I really enjoyed listening back to that. Yeah, it was interesting to see how where Quakers are in the whole picture of 
the discussion of reparations and thinking about what Edwina said about that single heroic narrative that Quakers have had about themselves in the context of slavery as well. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting, the fact that it's kind of acknowledged that it isn't straightforward. And I really appreciated Edwina talking about how, you know, she'd had different positions on this, but that actually we need to have those conversations and we need to take it forward because it, it is it's such an important thing. Mm. And the important thing about it actually being about the conversation around it, not just about handing over some money, but about what relationships are we building? What kind of society do we want to have? And having the conversation that helps us get there, that I felt really came across quite strongly in what they were both saying. Yeah, absolutely. And that stuff about this is not about just the past. This is about something that's incredibly relevant and ongoing. And I know when I was studying politics and doing, you know, modules on African politics and Latin American politics, you know, this is this is what's created the world we live in now, obviously not just in those continents all around the world. And it's not a case of, oh, this was 100 years ago, can we move on? It's it's absolutely at the heart of the, the global society we built. Definitely. And that's kind of what we're going to look at more in our next episode is about what historical examples of reparations do we have and how how do they still impact people today and, and what happened with some of those things? Yeah, really looking forward to that next episode that should be coming up pr- pretty soon, actually. And this is an area which Quakers are doing so much work on at the moment. There's actually quite a lot of stuff out there. So if this episode has whetted your appetite and you want to find out more, um, we've just had something called Yearly Meeting, which is the annual gathering of Quakers. And this topic was absolutely at the top of the agenda there. So there's loads of resources that we're building up to Yearly Meeting and have actually come out of Yearly Meeting as well. And I think they're available now, or some of them are available on the Quakers in Britain website, aren't they, Elizabeth? Yes, they're all being kind of gathered together at quaker.org.uk slash reparations to kind of create one central point so that people can find all the resources and courses and things like that coming up to help us discuss this further. Great. And obviously this is also part of like a, a long running conversation. So um, at Woodbrook, we've got a number of courses related to it, including some linked to what Quakers have been doing in America and things that can also, if you're a member of a Quaker community, we can come and work with your meeting on that. And also uh, every year Woodbrook does a lecture as part of yearly meeting. And this year it was called Perceiving the Temperature of the Water. And it was given by Helen Minnis. And it's very much on this topic of racism and colonialism. So I think on that page as well, but we'll also put a link in the show notes to it, is that lecture that's been recorded and captioned. And also some videos that Helen did leading up to the lecture, which again are really interesting and relevant. Yeah, they were and really helped kind of give a sense of things in the current time as well. They were really engaging videos to help kind of prepare people. So really useful. Yeah, and I found them really, really good. And a final little thing is before we go, we're going to leave you with a very brief clip from Paul Parker, who is the recording clerk of Quakers in Britain, which means he supports the yearly meeting, but he's also um, the most senior staff member for the charity that supports Quakers in Britain. And uh, this is just a very brief reflection on him from him about why the recent decisions by Quakers and this topic is so important and kind of what it means to him, which I think is is really worth a quick listen. So over to Paul. So for me, I think the key thing here is how we live with integrity. We cannot be the people who say that we care about equality, that we want to uh, express equality in our lives as part of our religious witness without acknowledging where we as a community have failed in the past. Uh, For me, there's a strong sense of the need to engage in a process of spiritual atonement. How do we live with the knowledge that as Quakers we are part of the problem both historically and today? I think often with reparations we make the mistake of thinking that they are only about the past and that fails to acknowledge that the injustices of the past that we might be talking about we continue, many of us, to be complicit in now. And so in order to live with integrity in the world now we have to deal with that complicity by engaging in a conversation about how we atone. That's it for this week's episode of A Quaker Take. It's been really great to start recording the podcast again. 
um, it's been too long. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It's uh, good to be back. And um, if there is anything you want to get in touch with us about, do you email me on elizabethp at quaker.org.uk about this or future or past episodes. Do you feel free to get in touch or follow us on social media at British Quakers or at Woodbrook UK. And we'll be back sooner than you think, probably in a month. But by the end of July, we've got to hold each other to that. Um, yeah, for we're aiming episode. for monthly episodes on this. So yeah. that's the plan. That's part of this mini reparation series. So yeah, we'll um, we'll be back with you soon. And thank you so much for listening. And I think there's nothing else to say except go well. Go friend. well, friends.